from Aracher and Tarbert. Loch Lomond is one of Scotland's best-known lochs. Here at the northern end, you pass beside narrow waters while high mountains loom above you. Savour the stunning views across the loch to Ben Lomond and the hills to the north. Further south, this freshwater loch broadens out. Little islands break the surface, their oak woods carpeted with bluebells and may. Deep glens are part of the spectacular landscape carved out by glaciers during the Ice Age. Ben Vorlich and Ben Lomond tower steeply above the freshwater loch, reaching heights of over 3,000 feet. The cold, deep waters of the loch plunge to some 650 feet. The ice-formed glens that reach far inland from here are obvious routeways and have been used as such for several thousand years. As you travel along the western banks of Loch Lomond, you're following a path which is well-worn, and not just by people. Until the mid-1800s, this was one of the main routes used to take cattle from the West Highlands to be sold in Edinburgh, Glasgow and further south. City dwellers needed food, and walking was the only way to get the fresh meat to them. But the cattle lost weight during their journey, so they had to be fattened up once they reached the rich pastures around urban centres. There were no cattle floats or chilled containers in those days. Walking the animals to market was known as droving, and it was an important seasonal occupation. Older cows and surplus young cattle were gathered together from late May onwards, between 100 and 300 beasts from each area. Now picture the drover with his small group of men and dogs and his precious herd of cattle as he sets off from his home in the west or the north. Initially, he has a journey perhaps 150 miles ahead of him, and he needs to plan carefully. He might walk 10 miles each day, leading his herd quietly and steadily over hills and through glens, sometimes even crossing large expanses of water. He must make sure that his cattle have good grazing, and a water supply each night. Shelter for the men is less important. There's little money, so they'll sleep out, wrapped in a plaid or a blanket. It's good to be in hand in case of cattle thieves. The drover may not return home until late autumn, earning a little money in farms on his way north again. The first drovers who followed this route were heading for the markets at Dumbarton before taking the animals further south. Later, from about 1770, Falkirk in the east became the main destination, with its principal markets in August, September and October. But the droving way of life was changing. It was becoming more costly. Improvements in farming practice meant that drovers now had to pay for overnight grazings. In addition, new military roads had been built, particularly across the southern highlands. These had an impact on the drove, they were surfaced with tiny stones that were easily picked up in the cattle's hooves, resulting in lameness, a financial disaster. Fortunately, for at least the first half of the journey, droves were through rough ground. But once these military roads were reached, the cattle were usually either given leather shoes or were shod. This was also a further cost. Droving was a way of life under pressure. Eventually, the road and rail networks extended further north and auction marts were set up right across the country. There was no more need for long-distance droving. It was the end of a tradition that had been part of Highland culture for generations. <laughs>